All right, I'm Brandon. I'm going to tell you a story. It starts with a fragile, tightly coupled system, poorly synchronized, impinging a single mutex, and prone to memory leaks. With a sprinkle of channels, of channels, of channels, and a dash of type parameters, it becomes simple, efficient, and dependency-free. The easy-to-use, hard-to-misuse of legend. This is a story of channels, a story of type parameters, a story of random matchmaking. Let's say five players start playing our game at once. Each is represented by a go routine handling a WebSocket connection. We need to produce any possible pairing of them. Somebody's left over, they wait for somebody else to join the queue. We might reach for a familiar data structure like a map or a queue to do this. It could work, but it leads us to some tricky questions. For a given match, how do we notify both go routines? In principle, one of them was waiting for the other, so it seems hard to implement this without some kind of loop, probably of the busy variety. What do we do when the waiting player closes their client? We need to implement cancellation for this, and that has to be safe with respect to another player joining concurrently. Which side is responsible for cleaning up entries? And will it be OK for every operation of any kind to hit a single mutex, given that I expect many concurrent connections. We reach act one of our story, exposition complete. We want multiple go routines to coordinate. Rather than data structures, a better approach is to view our system in terms of the communication, which is to say, how are we going to use channels? What do player connections, in other words, go routines, say to each other? That's a match request. Player A wants to provide a way for player B to communicate with them and agree that they're matched. So we need a channel of channels. Both sides need to agree on an ID for their match, which means one side has to construct it and tell the other what it is. Yet another communication, yet another channel. So we have Chan, Chan, Chan. And if we just follow the communication here, we end up with a complete matchmaking system that fits on one slide, if just barely. This solves almost every problem that I've talked about, and then some. We get concurrency for free, since it's all based on channels. We get cancellation for free through the usual mechanism with contexts. Both sides learn immediately about their match, including whether they're the side responsible for resources. And as a bonus, there's only one method to call to do all functionality. It'd be great if this actually did everything that we need. As part of implementing game logic, we also want the resource ego routine to know the player ID on the other side. We don't have a space to communicate right, that right now. Also, you may have noticed it's a little bit difficult to read that code. Uh, it, it's hard to understand why we're creating all those channels. Comments do help, but we can define some intermediate types to have their names serve as a stronger kind of documentation. So Chan 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 never actually made it into this project. I hope you liked my hook. It did help us to learn something, which is that communication deduplicates state. That was the main goal for me with this refactor. We already have our players represented in Go routines, so we shouldn't need to represent them in another data structure. Channels, and hence communication, turned that state into control flow. But that was only act one of the story. Really, that, that was all advice that you've heard before. Share memory by communicating. Act two is something new. And it arises because actually using this turns out to be a little awkward. A naive approach leads to an import cycle. As a quick fix, we just move the existing match ID type into a shared package. But I don't want the business logic to care about how the web server identifies games, so I don't want to put the ID type in the game package. I also definitely don't want to make a whole new package just for this. There's definitely a cleaner solution. To get there, we need to try thinking some simpler thoughts about the code. In terms of operations on types, it's hardly doing anything. We need both sides of a match to agree on one thing, and we need both sides to exchange a different thing. All we do is send those things through channels. We don't care that they're match or player IDs. And in Go 118, we gained a way to express that we don't care what we're handling. Add a type parameter, or two in this case. The uh, slide title here is a reference that maybe a handf handful of people in the audience will recognize. Uh, 
it's important to note, we aren't going to reuse this anywhere else. The usual advice is that generics is best for libraries, but this is application code. Apparently, I've been following Axel's advice earlier to use generics wrong for a while now. We have type parameters, but they aren't actually going to change. Except where they do, say in unit tests. Here, type parameters give us something like dependency injection, but much cheaper in terms of lines of code. Or when we iterate a bit further and find out that we need to adjust our requirements. The code is parametric, so it doesn't need to change. We just adjust our types. This was so easy to do that I forgot I even did it until this morning when I was doing my final check on the slides. With type parameters, this is complete. By implementing this, we learn the theme of Act 2. Type parameters do more than make code generic. They also make code modular. The end.